since apparently serial correlation is a problem for us, we need to figure out, know how to test for it. So one of the things that you always get in your software output is a Durbin-Watson statistic. So the Durbin-Watson statistic is the sum of the square first differences in your least squared residuals divided by the sum of the squared least squared residuals. And Durbin and Watson have shown that when rho is zero, their test statistic has a value of two. When rho is positive, the test statistic is less than two. When rho is negative, the test statistic, this thing, b hat, is bigger than two. And in any case, b hat, the Durbin Watson statistic, is between zero and four. It never be negative because it's involved just squared terms, and as it turns out, it can't be bigger than four. But it's under the null hypothesis that there's no serial correlation, that distribution is centered on two. If there is serial correlation, then b hat is centered on a number other than two. If there's positive serial correlation, then d hat is centered on a number less than two. If there's a uh, negative serial correlation, then d hat is centered on a number bigger than two. So the idea is in this figure. If the de data evol evolves frenetically, then uh, the distribution is centered below two. If it's evolving smoothly, it's centered above two. Well, how do you know whether or not your data is evolving frenetically or smoothly? Well, you don't. And there's not a test to decide. So as a consequence, if you look at the Durbin-Watson tables, they always have an upper and a lower value. They'll give you a du, where that's the critical value from the upper distribution, <coughs> the most extreme distribution that it can take. And dl is the critical value when it's centered on the most extreme, small possible d. So if your data is evolving as most frenetically as it possibly could, those are the DL values in the third and bottom table. And so if you, from your computer output, you get a test, an observed test statistic that falls down here below DL, for sure you reject the null hypothesis of no serial correlation. If you get an observed durbin watson test statistic <laughs> that's above the upper, you say, I don't reject the null. The problem area is in between. Suppose your observed Durbin Watson statistic falls between DL and DU. What do you do then? Huh. Go out and get some more data and hope to clarify it. It's very unusual to see a Durbin Watson statistic that falls between the two numbers. From time to time it happens, but it's not often. Is the Durbin Watson test statistic really great? Well, no. Because the Durbin Watson test, test statistic is good for testing the hypothesis. So here's our, here's our model. Yt is equal to xt beta plus ut. The null hypothesis is that uh, ut is equal to white noise. The alternate hypothesis that you're testing is that ut is equal to rho ut minus 1 plus epsilon t. So the durbin watson test statistic is robust only for that very specific test. If the serial correlation in your data is of some other order, say AR2, the durbin watson test statistic turns out not to be too good. If your error process turns out to be a moving average instead of an autoregression, it also is not any good. So the Durbin-Watson test statistic is a very special test and not very robust against alternatives other than the one that's on the board. All hope is not lost because, fortunately, we have a better weapon in our arsenal. We can use the Brush-Gottfried test against more general alternatives.
So the null hypothesis always is that our uh, our error term is white noise against the alternative that it's either an autoregressive process of some unknown order or a moving average of some unknown order. So we can test against the alternate hypothesis that the disturbance is an autoregressive process of the peak order so that today's disturbance depends on yesterday's disturbance, the one the day before, all the way out to peak periods ago, and the white noise term. Another alternative could be that it's a moving average, that today's disturbance is a history of some part, some finite part of the history of the white noise. So again, Durbin Watson is good against this very specific alternate hypothesis. This one happens to be a special case of what I call H1 here, a very special case. So Brush and Godfrey say the thing to do is run your garden variety regression, <laughs> construct the least squares residuals, use those residuals to construct a sigma hat square, uh, and then construct a very special matrix from the least squares residuals that we'll call big EP, where P is the order of the autoregressive process or moving average process that you believe to be generating the error data. So the, act, the actual dimension of EP is going to depend on some judgment on your part. When you take 518 with uh, Dr. Wei, you'll have these discussions. How do we decide on the proper autoregressive order? How do we decide on the proper moving average order? But for the moment, we'll say that it's something that we know. So you construct this EP. You construct the test statistic that we'll call little l, looks pretty complicated. Uh, but basically what it amounts to is running the regressions of uh, the least squares term, this period on last period, this period on two periods ago, this period on one and two and three periods ago, this period on one, two, three, and four periods ago, and so on and so forth, and assembling all those regression forms, and then using them to construct this test statistic which has a, and then using those implicit regressions to construct an error sum of squares and then a quadratic form. And so it's a ratio of two quadratic forms which is going to have a chi-square distribution. And the number of degrees of freedom in this chi-square test statistic is P, which was the order that you picked. So again, Rush and Godfrey is a button on your computer software. If you have time series data, almost for sure you have serial correlation. And therefore, you're going to conduct one of these tests, Durbin Watson, Brush Fagan, or there are some others that you'll find in your software packages also. So would it be appropriate for you to apply, say, a Durbin Watson test statistic to cross-section data? The simple answer is no. Would it be appropriate for you to apply the test for heteroscedasticity that we talked about last before the break to time series data? The simple answer is no. They're not designed for that. There's a whole set of other tests for the U for arch and darts and those other kinds of models. But that's another semester, another class. 